morning. How is everyone? It's, we've had the snow and now the rain. I don't know what's next. It's been a mess. I hope everyone is doing all right. Uh, good to see you all here. Don't have a huge crowd, but we have plenty for a good study of Colossians. This will be our last uh, lesson in, this, in the book of Colossians. And uh, we've gotten into chapter four. If you were here last week, we finished up chapter three, which kind of runs over into verse one of Colossians four. And we started talking a little bit about Colossians four. Uh, and now we're going to, we're ready for verses five and six. That's where we'll start today. The, the, the thing is, after verse six, the letter changes a bit and Paul goes into saying his goodbyes. And so it's a little bit different letter at that point. So I think today's study is going to be a bit different than the others. We will have some discussion on Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6. We can discuss that as much or as little as you guys like. But after that, we probably won't have a whole lot more to discuss. Once we've had enough time to talk about verses 5 and 6, uh, we'll, I really just want to use after that to talk about these people that Paul mentions at the end of the letter. I don't know if there's a, we can certainly, if you have comments or questions about them, we will have some discussion, but mostly after we get past verse six, I plan on really just sort of talking about who these men are that Paul addresses at the end of the letter. And if after that, we still have some time, we'll talk a little bit about this epistle of the Laodiceans. And if we still have time after that, we'll just, we'll just be done. But I think that'll probably take up the whole time. So this is definitely one way or the other going to be the last time we're in the book of Colossians, at least in this particular class. So to get us kicked off, am I doing something wrong? Let me take my mask off. I apologize. Uh, I gotten kind of paranoid you know every time you have a little sniffle you don't want to give it to anybody because every time you get a little sniffle you have to worry if you have covid and uh, we were exposed to covid though we'd been tested and didn't come down with it and they had told us to wear a mask for 10 whole days i think five days and get tested then five more days and the five days is coming the 10 days are coming gone but i <laughs> still keep wearing it just in case uh but for the class i better take it off so let's look at verses five and six in uh, colossians four Walk in wisdom towards those who are outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. And Paul had made a similar comment in Ephesians. Ephesians and Colossians are very similar letters. And normally I've tried to stay mostly in Colossians uh, because I think you, can, you should be able to understand the Colossian letter on its own because the Colossians were expected to understand it on their own. But I do think it's interesting to look at the parallel or the similar passage in Ephesians uh, because Paul adds a comment that's not here. In Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16, he wrote to the Ephesians, see that you walk circumspe circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Okay, so far, it sounds like the same idea. Then he adds, because the days are evil. So in Colossians, they don't get this, this little add on because the days are evil. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if, you, if the idea is just as easy to understand without that additional reason for why they should, uh, uh, why they should have wisdom towards outsiders and why they should walk as, as the wise, but it's still true. I don't think that the, the uh, days had stopped being evil between the time that Paul had written to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, and have they stopped being evil right on down to today. 
When you look out in the world, you see goodness and grace and love and mercy everywhere you go. Sometimes, right? But is that, the, is that the normal state of the world? So I think the days are still evil. And so I think this lesson that Paul has for the Ephesians and the Colossians is still just as pertinent today. And so there in six, he says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So what is it to speak with grace? If we're always, our speech is to be not sometimes with grace, but always with grace. So if it's to be always with grace, we better understand what that means. What do you think it means to speak with grace? Or if that's too hard, what's the opposite of speaking with grace? You can define it in terms of the, what to avoid doing. During these difficult times, you're going to have a lot of confrontations just on the subject of you are one of those atheists. You only yeah. believe yeah. in one God. And, uh, this time period, you're going to have a lot of confrontations between the unbelieving Jews and believing Jews. And it's very tempting when someone's challenging your faith, maybe the sincerity of your faith, uh, to to ramp up your argumentative attitude and to think of defending yourself rather than defending the truth and thinking about God. Peter, even in the midst of dark trials, says, always be ready to give an answer to hope that's within you with gentleness and reverence. And, and so I think he helps us understand that there's no excuse to have a demeaning and belittling attitude towards someone. Even though you know they're in the wrong, you know they're living in sin, they're living in darkness, there's no excuse for you to have that kind of attitude. We, we need to always conduct ourselves in a way that would lead them to God, not away from God. And so I need to calculate my approach to whoever it is to accomplish my long range, if not short range. Right, right. Amen. And knowing so you started that comment with setting up sort of the context of confrontation. When you're in confrontation, then these are some examples of where you can use grace. So as, as, as other people feel that that's where this comes into play, that maybe it's easy to speak with grace when you're at home with your family and the kids are behaving, everything's going well, that's when you speak with grace. Is it in times of conflict and confrontation that we're tempted not to speak this way? Or is there a possibility that sometimes when everything's going well and, and things are complacent and you're not on guard, is that also an opportunity to maybe speak in a way that's inappropriate? When you're agitated, it's maybe more difficult to talk in grace. Absolutely. So maybe that's why Paul brings up, at least in the Ephesian letter, that the days are evil. Maybe it's, the, it's when confronting the evil of the world that we're most tempted to not speak with grace. But we still, I don't think, have really settled on what it is to speak with grace. It's hard when you're in a confrontation. So is speaking with grace, is it, Dempsey, you kind of touched on, you, you mentioned, you know, focus, so keeping the focus on God. So that's part of the answer. So what does that mean? Is it just always saying kind things, always saying what the other person wants to hear, never raising your voice? Is that what it means to speak with grace? Yeah, I think you're in a conversation with somebody else and you're discussing something that they disagree with you and specifically you pick on the about Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's easy to, you know, ridicule them or to say something that is you know, insulting to them. That's not going to bring them to Jesus. Yeah, not insulting, not ridicule. Yeah, and, 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 and think about anything that we would disagree yeah. on. It's easy for me to put those, all these little sayings that, you know, somebody can say that kind of puts me into the yeah. conversation. Um, and so you don't want to, your goal isn't just to prove yourself right and to be, put yourself above them. It's to try to convince them through the way you talk and the way you live to become a Christian, yeah. and not necessarily to be right. 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 Yeah, amen. And, and I think we're hearing from your comment and from Dempsey's comment, some of the same ideas that the focus is on you know, speaking 
as God wants us to speak. And as you said, what kind of language is going to lead someone to Christ? You know, that's really the ultimate hope is this person you're in conflict with will cease living for the world, cease living for the world, which is evil and become a child of God. Are you going to accomplish that by insulting them? Or are you going to accomplish them, accomplish that by um, demeaning them and mocking them? But having said that, are there examples where Jesus can be insulting, maybe even mocking? Think about Jesus' attitude towards the Pharisees. Does Jesus ever insult the Pharisees? Brood of vipers. Yeah, if I got in an argument with Dempsey and I called Dempsey a brood of vipers, he would probably feel that I was not speaking with grace. And maybe I'm not. What's the difference? What's the difference between talking to your fellow brother in Christ like that and talking to the Pharisees like that? Okay, Christ knew their hearts. Do we ever know people's hearts? He was in a position to actually judge. Are we, are we in a position to judge? Not the way he did, but sometimes they're judged with righteous judgment. So do we ever know the hearts of people? How do we know the hearts of people? I always hear people say we don't know the hearts of people. I'm not sure that's entirely true. How can you know what's in a person's heart? By their fruit, right? But it comes out in, in how they act. So you, you can know that a person is a Pharisee. If they act like a Pharisee, they walk like a duck, talks like a duck. So can you get a little harsh with someone? If Jesus is their example, can you tell someone that they're a brood of vipers if that's what they really need to hear? Or am I going in the wrong direction with this? Hmm? Yes, was that a yes? Okay. And I think it comes back to what said all, said before, like what's the goal? Are you telling them something? Or are you giving them harsh truths because it's what they need to hear and it's good for them? Or are you just trying to cut them down and win the argument? You said it's not about winning the argument, right? So if, if you're trying to just sort of get them, oh, I got you good, then it can't be right. Even if it's gentle, it can't be right. Go ahead, Dempsey. People, people love as a rule the arena of subjective rhetoric. Yeah. You know, well, we just want to back them up. Well, we just want to back and forth. What do you think? What do you feel about this? When you're in that arena, it's, you're much more prone to go in the wrong direction to hurt someone, to say something you have no business saying. And so the first thing I want to do is get it off of myself and get it into the arena of objective truth. You know, what does the Bible say? It's not who's right here, what's wrong. Right. What does the Bible say? You know, read, look at this. Will you consider this? Think about what this says and get it on to an absolute standard as, as soon as you possibly can and get it off. Right, right. Amen. And that, that comment and a lot of the others, not all, but a lot, we've kind of focused on, you know, leading others to Christ when you have these sort of conversations. But also, when does Paul say, or when does Paul say to speak with grace? During the Bible study? When you're at church? Always. So even, you know, you go to the grocery store and you're talking to the checkout. Well, you know, you want this in a bag. Right. When you go to work and your boss says, I want to talk to you about what you're working on right now. When you're at school and you're sitting next to someone and they say, you know, hey, did you get the assignment? When you're talking in those situations, the same thing. It has to be with grace. Everything, every encounter we have with people, it needs to be with grace. And then coming to our next point, it needs to be seasoned with salt. And since our speech is to always be with grace, the salt is not an exception. It's not like be gracious most of the time, but be a little salty some of the time. The salt goes right along with the grace. It doesn't contradict it. So what is the salt? What does it mean to have your gracious speech sprinkled with, seasoned with salt? <sighs> salt makes things taste better. It's come out better, okay. Better how? Tasting better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So dealing with facts, not emotion, dealing with things that really matter and not just who scores the points for winning the argument, is that the, is that the salt? Thoughts? How, how does this tie into the salt? I think one of the right ideas. While you think about that, let's look at what Jesus had to say about salt. If we were to look over at Matthew 5.13, we would read, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savior, we, save, savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under, under the foot of men. And Jesus' quote is saying something very similar in Mark chapter 5, verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, what, with what will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So salt is something Jesus wanted us to have too. And those are Jesus' thoughts on it. So looking at what Jesus has to say about the salt we're supposed to have and what Paul says about seasoning our gracious speech with salt, what do we think it is? Well, I think we're on the right idea. Coming back to what Mary said, what ultimately glorify God. If we come back to what Mary said, you know, salt makes stuff taste good, right? It's, it's, uh, if something just has, if you have food on your plate, there's no, like I cannot eat broccoli if it is not salted. Some people say they don't like broccoli. I don't like broccoli unless it's salted. If you put salt on it, it tastes fine to me. And you, maybe broccoli is not the one for you. Maybe you always hate broccoli, but there's probably foods that you know of that they're fine if they're salted, but just plain, it's just, it's just nutrients. It's just boring in your mouth. Increase further dialogue, right? I, I think so. I think that it gives it meaning, right? It's when you, if you have an egg, right? That's the classic example. Fried egg doesn't really taste like much of anything until you salt it, and then it tastes good. It's a nice breakfast. The salt gives it meaning. Jesus says without salt, when the salt loses its saltiness, it has meaning. So you can say gracious things. You can say, Mary, I'm very glad that you're here. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. It's a gracious thing. But it's also just, on a certain level, it's just pleasantries. If you really want to provoke people to become better, it's not enough to just always be nice and just to always avoid confrontation. There has to be some meat in there. There has to be some salt. There has to be something that gives your speech some value. So when you say to another person, you know, I love you and I want what's best for you, that's gracious. But when you say, I love you and I want what's best for you, therefore, I want you to know Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Now, there's some teeth to it. Now, it's not just a pleasantry. It's still gracious, but now it means something. So I, I think that's part of what we're getting at here. Not just gracious speech, but gracious speech that has a value. Uh, da, da, da. The other thoughts on the saltiness or the graciousness? Right, yeah, you have to know when to season it to get the right results. And this comes back, to, I think, to what I was saying about the Pharisees. Sometimes salt can be a little salty. <laughs> you know, sometimes it puts a little bite in what you're saying. But if you have reason and discernment, if you, if you are trying to have the mind of God, if you're trying to do what Jesus has demonstrated for us to do, you're always going to do it for the right reasons. You're always going to do it in accordance with God's will. So yeah, it takes some thought. You have to put some thought into the things you said. One, you... One that in every case, you look at the jailer in Acts 16, the Ethiopian man in Acts chapter 8, uh, the woman at the well in John 4. There's that element of hope. And, you know, you can start out not handing someone a list of rules, uh, 
uh, even though they may be true. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't start out pointing the finger. You don't see Jesus saying that to the Samaritan woman. He, he's eating with the public publicans and the sinners. Why? Well, because there's an element of hope there. Oh, there's hope here for us, even for us. Now, at some point, all of them got to the point of convicting someone of sin. That has to happen. But without hope, there's no drive. There. There's no motivation. Right. There's no incentive. Right. right. Amen. And if you couldn't hear all that, you know, we're talking about how there's a there's a right order to these things. You know, you don't jump in when the first time you talk to someone with all the weightier, weightier matters of the law. And I, that makes me think one of the reasons probably that Jesus could be a little harsher with the Pharisees than we want to be with someone who's never heard the word of Christ is they knew it all, right? These were the most learned people in the world. You didn't start them with first principles. You, you let them know, that you guys already know first principles. You're not, you already know advanced Calc 4. You're just not doing it, right? But when we talk to someone who has never known the Lord, doesn't know anything about the Bible, doesn't know anything about God, then you're going to start them in a very different place when that conversation starts. So Paul's, is in Paul's instruction here only to the Colossians who are comfortable speaking to others? Well, the reason that we want it to be seasoned with salt is, he says, so that you will know how to answer every man. Does that only apply to the Colossians who are comfortable telling other people about God, about Jesus? Well, that's his instructions to all the Colossians. So that's his instructions to us as well. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to have a sit-down Bible study. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to proclaim the Word of God as loudly as everyone else, but everyone is to be able to answer every man and to know how to do it properly and to be able to do it graciously and with salt. In other words, to do it graciously in a way that has meaning and is right and can accomplish something. So if you're shy, if you don't like to speak a whole lot, you don't have to be the leader in this area. There's different, lots of different parts of the body and your role may usually be some, but every Christian has to have this quality of being able to answer every man. It's something we need to seek to have if we don't have it already. So, and if you're shy, remember Moses was shy too, <laughs> but with God, you can do it. Yeah. All right, anything else here on verses five and six, or is there anything we've talked about here recently that you had a thought or a comment we wanted to go over some more before we get into the Paul's closing of this letter? Oh, yes. Hello. Uh huh. Hello, Rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And that's how, and that's a great example. Yeah, that's a great example because it doesn't have to be anything complicated. And sometimes you don't have a Bible handy. You don't have to say, well, there's a verse. I could talk to that person if I had my Bible. Then I could flip to this verse and show it to them. It doesn't have to be anything sophisticated or complicated. It could be whatever you have to offer. Just keep it gracious. Try to season it with salt. And you can have a big impact on people. Yeah, wonderful example. Anything else? All right, then we'll jump into this last section of, of Colossians chapter four, where Paul is saying his goodbyes. And I'll pick up uh, with verse seven, where we left off and read the rest of the chapter. And then we'll talk about who some of these people are. And I'm probably not going to say these names, right? Uh, Tychicus, who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord shall declare unto you all my circumstances. I have sent him unto you for the same purpose that he might know your state and comfort your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and also Mark, Barnabas's sister's son, concerning whom ye received instructions that if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, who was called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, a servant of Christ, who is one of you, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for your prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Damas greet you. Salute the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Okay, so before we talk about these men and men and maybe one woman, if we get down to it, it's not clear if it's if that's Nymphus or Nympha uh, there at the uh, later part there. But uh, let me put on here, just so we understand the geography, because he mentioned some other, Paul mentioned some other places here. I think it'll help us kind of anyway. Here is the Lycus River in what we would call Turkey. And over here, we've got, sorry, that looks like a G, um, Colossae. And up here in this valley, we've got Laodicea. And then up here, not too far away, we've got this other city he mentions, Hierapolis. And this distance, from here to here is not very far. Even in a society where people had to walk a lot, it was, it was not the end of the earth. Uh, Ephesus is over there by the sea, I think like 100 miles. But these three cities are clustered together. And different sources are giving me different distances here. It looks like though they're about 10 miles between Laodicea and uh, Colossae which is like, if this is downtown Lexington, then this is maybe Athens. And this, this distance is even shorter. Maybe a little bit more than that, but still shorter. So this all fits within Fayette County easy with plenty of room to spare. So these, these guys are all neighbors. That's why he's addressing them and telling them they can share letters and they can, you know, some of these people seem to be associated with one town or the other. There's kind of some overlap here. There's probably a lot of contact between the Christians in Laodicea and in Colossae. Okay, so the first Christian mentioned here is uh, 
Well, the first one really is Tychus, but I didn't have, a, I should have I looked into him. Let's talk, start with Onesimus. Uh, so Onesimus is probably one of the names that's most likely to ring a bell. I mean, Luke and Mark are probably the most recognizable here, but Onesimus is another one of the big ones. So I'll go ahead and ask you, who is Onesimus? Hmm? Yeah, runaway slave, right? Who, who owned Onesimus? Philemon. Philemon, who gets a book named after him. So there's a, another letter, another epistle in the Bible, Philemon. And what is the subject of Philemon? Yeah, returning the slave Onesimus and reconciliation, wanting, uh, wanting Philemon to treat him as a brother. And does, does Paul order Philemon to let Onesimus go free? No, he doesn't. But what does he say about Onesimus? He wants Philemon to do. He asks. He doesn't command, but he asks. Don't treat him harshly. Paul, what does Paul want from Philemon and Onesimus? Right. Paul wants to make use of Onesimus. Onesimus, uh, you know, Paul has this entourage, this group of fellow Christians who are working with him. And Paul wants Onesimus to be one of these Christians who he can rely on to help him in his mission to spread the gospel, particularly to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And Onesimus is useful to Paul, but Paul can't make use of Onesimus because Onesimus is not a free man. Onesimus has run away, and Paul is not willing to just say, okay, it's fine. We'll just, since, since slavery is such a bad thing, we'll just pretend that Philemon doesn't have any any legal rights here. And you know, Paul's not willing to do that, right? So Paul writes to Philemon as a Christian, as a brother, and says, you know, you, you can do what you want to do, but, you know, I'm asking you, Onesimus will be very useful to me. And here we see Onesimus is working with Paul. Now, I don't know if that means that Philemon wrote back and said, yeah, let you, Onesimus can stay and do all the work with you, or if this is Paul sending, preparing to send Onesimus back because Philemon lives in this area, probably Colossae, maybe somewhere in the area. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I got lost here. Okay, so he says he's sending. Onesimus, this area, I, this could be the follow-up to Philemon. We don't, we don't really know. But it's also possible that this is at another time, and Onesimus has simply been able to continue working with Paul because Philemon uh, did what Paul asked of him in the letter to Philemon. Uh, then there we read about uh, Aristarchus. It says he also sends his greetings, and uh, he is mentioned in the letter Philemon as well. It's another reason we kind of know all these guys are connected to each other. If you looked over in Philemon, verses 23 and 24, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, and Marcus, Aristarchus, Damas, and Luke, my fellow laborers. So here is a, uh, another Christian uh, who is associated with this area, and he is sending his greetings back, and he does the same thing into the letter to Philemon, because that letter is also coming to the same area where he would have known uh, many Christians. Uh, Paul mentions Mark, the cousin of, of uh, Barnabas. That's John Mark. We know him very well. So I'm going to move on to Jesus, who was called Justice. And there is another Justice mentioned in Acts. I don't know if this is the same guy or not, but in the in the uh, he, there's a Corinthian mentioned in Acts 18, beginning with verse 5. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. But when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one who worshiped God and whose house was adjoining the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed the Lord with all his house, and me, the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So this justice could be the Corinthian that Paul met then, or it could be another justice. We just, if it's not the one mentioned in Acts, then we don't know anything else about him. 
Uh, we have Epaphras mentioned next. He was mentioned earlier in the book of Colossians. Back in verse 6 and 7, we read, uh, which has come unto you as it has all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth unto you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Ye also learned it from Epaphras, our dear, dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So Epaphras is also maybe from this area, associated from this area. He has been teaching the Christians in Colossae. And he is with Paul now, and he is sending his greetings. And he is also mentioned uh, in that same passage we saw in Philemon's verses 23 and um, 24, where we saw uh, uh, Aristocarchus send his greetings to Philemon. Uh, Epaphras was also mentioned as sending his greetings. So these are these men who are working with Paul wise in prison at this time. Luke, we know Luke, Luke the great physician, he's known very well. Damas, who's mentioned here, he's another one who sends his greetings in Philemon. But if you look over at 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 through 12, things aren't going so well with Damas. Paul had written to Timothy, do your best to come to me soon for Damas in love with the present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So I don't know if this is afterwards and Damas has been restored, but probably not. Second Timothy seems to be later than this. So Damas was working with Paul. And what was it that led him away? The world, love of the world. Isn't that what gets so many? Love of the world. You fall in love with the world and a person who is in love with the world can also, for a time, be in love with God, be in love with the truth. But if the love of the world doesn't go away, it can catch back up with you. Eventually, following God can become a little bit more difficult than you thought it was going to be, and you go back to the world. You know, brother, uh, one thing I definitely come away with is the number of Clearly knew each other, yeah. um, were acquainted with one another, loved one another, yeah. growing in that love one another. Christianity is relationship. Amen. Is relationship. Uh, he, he'll mention a pastor here who was one of you, yeah. a servant of Christ. And he couldn't say that unless they they knew one another extremely well. There was a relationship going on there. I suggest even a commitment had been made between them, you know, to help each other. You know, it may be, it may be not verbally stating, but there was a definite sense of responsibility toward one another. Uh, these weren't just Christians at large. I'm baptized, I'm out of here. You know, they knew each other, they built relationships, they wanted to build on those relationships and bring more people into right. the fold. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's very important for us to see that Christians belong together. Amen. Amen. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted to kind of go through who these guys are instead of just read off their names, be done with it. Because, you know, these guys, you read this list and say, well, these guys are a bunch of brothers. And when you see them over in Philemon and you see the same group mentioned together, they say, wow, these guys are close. This is a band of brothers. They're brothers to each other. But guess what? They're your brothers, too. You know, these men have not died. I like the comment that you made, you know, those who've gone before, the relationship is not in the past, but the relationship is in the future. You think these guys lived 2,000 years ago, so you don't have a relationship with them? Don't think like that. You do have a relationship with these men. These men are not dead if they died in Christ. These men live and will live again. And so these are still our brothers, and you're not going to see them in the first century, but you're going to see them in the future. That relationship will be in the future. It's good to know who these guys are. It's, they're not just names on a piece of paper. They're real brothers in the body of Christ. That makes them your brothers just as much as the brother, people who are sitting on the pew around you are your brothers and sisters. These are your brothers just as much as they are. Onesimus, you've heard that name so many times probably, but he's your brother. He's your brother in Christ. And, you know, Damas was too, but I don't know if he, if he finished the race because of what Paul says there in Timothy. And that's a sad thing when you realize this was your brother who may have been lost. And Damas has been immortalized in the Pilgrim's Progress, one of the most famous works of literature. He makes it in there. And, uh, you know, this is not biblical, obviously. This is just someone's 
work of fiction, but it's one of the most famous works of fiction in, in Western literature. And Damas has a place in there. I'll read a little excerpt here. It says, then I saw in my dream that a little off the road over against the silver mine stood Damas, gentlemanlike, to call to passengers to come and see, who said to Christ and his fellow, ho, turn aside hither and I will show you a thing. And Christian says, what thing so deservingly as to turn us out of the way to see it? And Damas says, here is a silver mine and some digging in it for treasure. If you will come with a little pains, you may richly provide yourselves. And Hope says, then said Hopeful, let us go see. Not I, said Christian, I have heard of this place before now and how many have there been slain? And beside that, treasure is a snare to those who seek it, for it hindereth them in their pilgrimage. Then Christian called to Damas, saying, Is not the place dangerous? Have it not hidden, hindered many in their pilgrimage? Damas said, Not very dangerous, except to those who are careless. But withal, he blushed as he spake. <laughs> then said Christian to Hopeful, Let us not stir a step, but still keep on our way. And Hope said, I will warrant you, when buy-in comes up, if he hath the same invitation as we, he will turn and thither to see. And Christian said, no doubt thereof, for his principles lead him that way, and a hundred to one, but he dies there. And Damas said, then Damas called again, saying, but you will not come over and see. So the cares of the world. And then that's how the cares of the world. I love that line in there where he says, when it, Christian asks if it's dangerous, right? Damas doesn't say it's not dangerous, Um not very dangerous, not very dangerous, uh, except to those who are careless. You know, here's a, here's a thing that the world loves that's, that's, that's not in the, it's not in the mind of God. It's not following Christ. Is it a danger to get involved with it? Eh, maybe a little, but if you're careful, you'll be okay. It's only the careless that get snared in the terrors of the world. And that's the attitude. And again, that's a fictional, I don't know if it's totally fair to, fair to Damas, to put words in his mouth like that, but that's the attitude of those who are led away by the world. It doesn't, you don't sit there and say, well, I thought about it. I made a list of all the reasons to stay true to God. I made a list of all the reasons to fall away and follow the world. And I found that there was more, more for me in the world. You don't do that. You think I'll just stop off on this way for a little while. I'll just tarry in this silver mine. It's a great analogy. You know, I'll just tarry in this silver mine for a little while. Then I'll get back on the road that leads to God. You know, I, I'll be careful. And that's how it starts. And it just baby steps you right on out of the kingdom of God. So that's Demos's example. And then there's uh, Nymphos or Nympha. So I'm not sure whether this is a, a man or a woman. The uh, King James, New King James, uh, have nymphos as a man. Most other Bibles have uh, nympha and a female. That's because most Bibles are based on uh, the modern critical text, where in the last couple hundred years, scholars have gone back and said, well, we found some other Bibles, and we're the experts, and we've decided that this is what the, the Greek text originally looked like. I'm not a big fan of those texts. There's, we could have a big discussion on that. Some people like them, some people don't. I'm a big King James, New King James fan, because I like the older, I shouldn't say older, but I like the text it's based on. Uh, the one thing I found interesting about this, I checked the patriarchal text that the uh, Greek Orthodox uses, and apparently it also has this as a female. Uh, they also just took all the Greek Bibles that they had in their churches back in 1904 and kind of went through them and tried to make one consistent text where they looked at what was in most versions, what was not in most versions. And their text looks a lot like the New King James. So I like both of them, but they actually have the female here. So they, those guys who actually preserved all these Greek texts down through the years and still have them in their ancient churches also appear to believe that this is a woman. So that kind of gave me pause. I'm not, I can't, re, I, when I saw that it was male, he was mailing to King James, I was ready to reject all those other Bibles. But there appears to be a legitimate controversy here about whether or not this is uh, a man or a woman. And I think it's because if your name is Nymphos, which would be male, or nympha, which would be female, because this language has endings depending on where it's used in a sentence, like I think this would be the accusative case, uh, 
that when you put those endings on the end of the names, I think both of those male and female names wind up looking exactly the same in that particular case. So the only thing it tells you whether it's male or female is the following pronoun. And some ancient texts have a his house and some ancient texts have a hers house. So we don't really know. This may actually be a, a woman whose house they were meeting in. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I just sort of want to make you aware of that. So if you were reading along in your Bible and you're like, why did, when I read the text, like, why did they say meets in his house? My Bible says meets in her house. That's why there's a little unclear, un lack of clarity on what pronoun is there. But whether it's nymphos, a male, or nympha, a woman, it's a Christian who has a house and the church is meeting there and this letter is to be read there. Uh, Archippus was part of the church in Philemon's house. If you look at Philemon verses one through three, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I just can't help but ask questions. Uh, I didn't have this prepared, but I have a question for you. Who is the book of Philemon addressed to? To him and a church in his house, absolutely. Everybody, we always think of Philemon. Everybody says Philemon is a personal letter. It was written to Philemon. And that's true to an extent because it is addressed to him first. And it, the subject matter deals a lot with him. But if you look at who Paul actually addresses it to, he addresses it to Philemon and to the, their sister Aphia and their fellow soldier Archippus and the church in your house. So this letter, that letter, Philemon, is actually addressed to an entire church, not just to Philemon. And that's something that seems to be overlooked a lot. But Archippus was uh, part of that, uh, that church that met in Philemon's house. We saw him mentioned again over there. Okay, and that brings us to this reference here to the epistle to the Laodiceans. We're almost out of time, so I'll just kind of quickly give you some thoughts on this. It's there in verse 16 where Paul tells the Colossians to share this letter with the church in Laodicea and to read the letter that comes from Laodicea. So where is the epistle of the Laodiceans? It's not in my Bible and it's not in yours. There is a, a late forgery that claims to be the epistle of the Laodiceans. It's only found in Latin. There are no Greek copies of it and uh, it's very short and it appears to be just an effort to kind of plug this hole like somebody read about the letter of the layout of scenes you couldn't find it and said they'd well they'd go and make one up just to fix that so we've never found an actual letter of to, to the layout of scenes so there's a couple of possibilities here one of the most popular is uh that it could be the epistle to the ephesians that the letter to the ephesians well, i put an a there um that the letter to the ephesians after the ephesians had read it and probably made a copy of it uh it could have been carried to Laodicea, and when the Laodiceans were done with it, they were supposed to send it on to the Colossians. It's a very general, general epistle. It's uh, very similar to Colossians. It doesn't necessarily deal with anything which wouldn't be of great value to all Christians. And so it's possible that after the Ephesians read it, the Laodiceans read it, and then the Colossians are going to read it next. And you can sort of see the sort of direction we're coming from Ephesus to Laodicea on to Colossians. So that's one possibility. Another possibility would be, and this is this ties into what we just said about Philemon actually being a letter that was written to a church. Uh, it is possible that the letter to Philemon is a letter to Laodicea. One problem with that is it seems like Philemon probably lived in Colossae, but this guy, uh, uh, Archippus, we don't know anything else about him from the Bible, but other historical and traditional sources associate him as a bishop of the church of Laodicea. So it's possible that Philemon's house was actually more over here, that that church of Laodicea was meeting in his house. Uh, another possibility, though, is this was just a letter Paul wrote to the Laodicean, Laodiceans that simply has not been preserved for us, that we don't have a copy of it today. There was nothing in it that we needed. If you look at letters like Ephesians and Colossians and how much they overlap, uh, Laodicea may have been more of the same. Everything in this letter may have also been written to these guys. Go ahead. Sure. Exactly. Well, that's that's so so good. Great point. Dempsey says we have everything God wants us to have, which means if He wants us to have the letter, oh, to God, see it, 
then it must be, we must have it. And if we have it, it's probably the letter to the Ephesians or the letter to Philemon. If we don't have it, then the logic works back the other way. It's not something God wanted us to have. And that's not hard for me to see because again, if there, if there was another letter, I think it would cover a lot of the same material as a letter to the Colossians and a letter to the Ephesians. Everything that we have necessary for our understanding has been preserved for us. So we either don't have it, which is fine, or we do have it and we just call it something else, which is also fine. Okay. Well, I guess that wraps up uh, Colossians. Uh, thank you all very much. I've really enjoyed teaching the class. Hope you got something out of it. And uh, I think, I'm not sure what's next week. It will be a different class next week. So thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.